morning we're going to enter into the Old Testament story of David and Goliath. And your job is to hear it like a little kid would hear it, to be young enough and naive enough and imaginative enough to enter into the story, to see the sights, to smell the smells, to taste this. And we're going to do it together. First, I'm going to read you the story from 1 Samuel 17. It's a bit of a longer story, so cuddle up for that. Then I'm going to give you my two bits on what impressed me, and what impressed me may not be what impresses you through that story. The power of God's Word in the Bible is that it could mean as many different things or come in nuanced ways to each of us in this place. And a listening tip as we listen to the story from the Bible. Listen with expectation, as though God really did author the story, and God really is alive, and God really does love you and want to meet you and reveal something of who He is to you. Um, There's an old hymn that has a line in it that says, Beyond the sacred page, it's thee I seek, Jesus. And that's the way I engage, and I think we should all engage the reading of the Bible. We're listening to the story, and there's morals and ethics and values and teachings and laws and narrative truths, but through those things, the, the, the desire, hopefully, is to know Him more. And in the church's tradition, when a preacher gets up to preach, they used to call it exhorting the people, exhortation. And the exhortation moment was meant to be a moment that somehow through the foolishness and mystery of this interaction, God's Spirit inhabits the moment. You, me, us. So expect that. And the hope is that you'll be left with a certain impression or a new understanding of who God is, and again, also who you are. So, this is a story of David and Goliath. It is R-rated for violence. And it goes like this. The Philistines, who were the, I'll give a few editorial comments as we go through, but not too many, the enemies of the people of Israel who were God's people, drew up their troops for battle. They deployed them at Sokah in Judah and set up camp between Sokah and Azekah at Ephes Damim. Saul, the king of the Israelite people, God's people, and the Israelites came together camped at Oak Valley and spread out their troops in battle readiness for the Philistines. This was a warring time, the Bronze Age, and everybody was fighting about everything. The Philistines were on one hill and the Israelites on the opposing hill with the valley in between them. A giant, nearly 10 feet tall, stepped out from the Philistine line into the open, Goliath from Gath. He had a bronze helmet on his head and was dressed in armor, 126 pounds of it. He wore bronze shin guards and carried a bronze sword. His spear was like a fence rail. The spear tip alone weighed over 15 pounds, and his shield bearer walked ahead of him. Goliath stood there and called out to the Israelite troops, Why bother using your whole army? Am I not Philistine enough for you? And you're all committed to Saul, your king, aren't you? So pick your best fighter and pit him against me. If he gets the upper hand and kills me, the Philistines will all become your slaves. But if I get the upper hand and kill him, you'll all become our slaves and serve us. I challenge the troops of Israel this day. Give me a man and let us fight it out together." When Saul and his troops heard the Philistines' challenge, they were terrified and lost all hope. This guy was big, you know, like Zdeno Chara big, but a few feet on top of that. And as much of an enemy. No, I won't predispose the story to that. When Saul and his troops heard the Philistines' challenge, they were terrified and lost all hope. Enter David. He was the son of Jesse, the Ephrathite, from Bethlehem and Judah, the father of eight sons. Jesse himself was too old to join Saul's army. Jesse's three older sons had followed Saul to war. The names of the three sons who had joined up with Saul were Eliab, the firstborn, next Abinadab, 
and third, Shammah. David was the youngest son. While his three oldest brothers went to war with Saul, David went back and forth from attending to Saul to tending his father's sheep in Bethlehem. David was the last born, and that was pejoratively understood then. You were kind of the runt of the family, and the firstborn was lifted up high and great expectations, but the lastborn, not so much. Each morning and evening for 40 days, Goliath took a stand and made his speech. One day, Jesse told David, his son, take this sack of cracked wheat and these ten loaves of bread and run them down to your brothers at the camp, and take these ten wedges of cheese to the captain of their division. Check in on your brothers and see if they're getting along all right, and let me know how they're doing. Saul and your brothers and all the Israelites in their war with the Philistines in Oak Valley. David was up at the crack of dawn, and having arranged for someone to tend his flock, took the food that, and was on his way just as Jesse, his father, had directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the army was moving into battle formation, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines moved into position, facing each other, battle ready. David left his bundles of food with, in the care of a sentry and ran to the troops who were deployed and greeted his brothers. And while they were talking together, the Philistine champion, Goliath of Gath, stepped out from the front lines of the Philistines and gave his usual challenge. And David heard him. The Israelites, to a man, fell back at the moment they saw the giant, totally frightened. The talk among the troops was, have you ever seen anything like this? This man openly and defiantly challenging Israel, God's people. The man who kills the giant will have it made, they said. The king will give him a huge reward, offer his daughter as a bride, and give the entire family a free ride. David, who was talking to the men standing around him, asked, What's in it for the man who kills this Philistine and gets rid of this ugly blot on Israel's honor? Who does he think he is anyway, this uncircumcised Philistine? Which seems like an odd caricaturization, but the Israelites were all circumcised, and that was a sign of their covenant relationship with God, and the Philistines were not. Who, he, who does he think he is anyway, this uncircumcised Philistine, taunting the armies of God alive? They told him what everyone was saying about what the king would do for the man who killed the Philistine. And then Eliab, his older brother, heard David fraternizing with the men and lost his temper. What are you doing here? Why aren't you minding your own business and tending that scrawny flock of sheep? I know what you're up to. You've come down here to see the sights, hoping for a ringside seat at a bloody battle. What is it with you, David said? All I did was ask a question. And ignoring his brother, he turned to someone else and asked, and asked the same question again and got the same answer as before. The things David was saying were picked up and then reported to King Saul. Saul sent for him. Master, said David, don't give up hope. I'm ready to go and fight the Philistine. And Saul answered David, you can't go and fight the Philistine. You're too young and inexperienced, and he's been at this fighting business since before you were born. And David said, I've been a shepherd, tending sheep for my father, and whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I'd go after it, knock it down, and rescue the lamb. And if it turned on me, I'd grab it by the throat, wring its neck, and kill it. Lion or bear, it made no difference. I killed it. And I'll do the same thing to this Philistine pig who is taunting the troops of God alive. God who delivered me from the teeth of the lion and the claws of the bear will deliver me from the Philistine. So Saul said, go, and God help you. Then Saul outfitted David in a, as a soldier in armor. He put, his on, he put his bronze helmet on his head and belted his sword on him over the armor. And David tried to walk, but he could hardly budge. And David told Saul, I can't even move with this stuff on me. I'm not used to this. And he took it all off. And then David took his shepherd's staff and selected five smooth stones from the brook and then put them in his pocket, in the pocket of a shepherd's pack, and with his sling in his hand approached Goliath. As the Philistine paced back and forth, his shield-bearer in front of him, and he noticed David. He took one look down on him and sneered. 
a mere youngster, apple-cheeked and peach-fuzzed. The Philistine ridiculed David. Am I a dog that you come out here with, to, that you come after me with a stick? And he cursed David by his gods. Come on, said the Philistine. I'll make roadkill out of you for the buzzards. I'll turn you into a tasty morsel for the field mice. And David answered, You come at me with sword and spear and battle axe. I come at you in the name of God of the angel armies, the God of Israel's troops, whom you curse and mock. This very day God is handing you over to me, and I'm about to kill you and cut off your head and serve up your body and the bodies of your Philistine buddies to the crows and the coyotes. The whole earth will know that there is an extraordinary God in Israel, and everyone gathered here will learn that God does not save by means of sword or spear. The battle belongs to God. He's handing you to us on a platter. That understandably, roused the Philistine, and he started toward David. And David took off from the front line, running toward the Philistine. David reached into his pocket for a stone and slung it and hit the Philistine hard in the forehead, embedding the stone deeply. And the Philistine crashed face down in the dirt. That's how David beat the Philistine, with a sling and a stone and he hit him, and he killed him. No sword for David. And then David ran up to the Philistine and stood over him, pulled out the giant's sword from its sheath, and finished the job by cutting off his head. When the Philistines saw their great champion was dead, they scattered, running for their lives. When I first read it, or reread it again this week, two things really struck me. The first was that line from David where he said, God does not save by means of sword or spear. And immediately I started to think about power and power in the context of God's kingdom and power in the context of the kingdom of this world and how they are very often antithetic to one another. In God's kingdom, in the world within which God's will is done, His will often gets done via less than what appears to be optimal conditions or resources. God uses the weak to shame the strong. He uses the last to humble the first. He uses a child to humble the wisest of men or women. Our omnipotent, all-powerful God decides that he's going to come and take up residence with humanity as a baby. And through the weakness of an infant, God lets us hold him. God accomplishes his greatest work, the death and resurrection of Christ, through the death, the cross, through suffering and pain and becoming little and smaller, puts aside God's godness in order to display God's glory. Power has a different definition when it comes to the community that we're all a part of, this community of Christ. The kingdom of God is upside down, backwards, illogical, wonderful, beautiful, mysterious, and miraculous in its definition. And access to that power comes via one means. It is given to you and I and David by God and it is accessed in the giving via our expressing faith in response to the gift. In the chapter before the one that I just read that David and Goliath story from, we read about the giving part. God has already made the decision through the prophet Samuel, told him there's going to be a new king. Saul is on the way out. I'm going to send you to this family, David's family, and I'm going to point out somebody to you. You're going to anoint them. They're going to be the next king. Samuel goes there, figures the whole firstborn thing. That's the one he's going to choose, maybe secondborn, and they're all bigger and taller and full-grown men. And God says, the Lord says to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, 
for I've rejected him, the oldest ones. The Lord does not look at the things human beings look at. People look at the outward appearance, uh, outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so Samuel took the horn of oil, which, with which they anointed kings, and anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came on David in power. God chose him, run to the family, out of the eight boys, that family from that small little insignificant tribe, and he says, you're my person, and the power of the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And it was that power that somehow worked through David's youthful, naive, hubristic maybe, can-do attitude that enabled David to say yes when faced with this insurmountable battle with Goliath. David believed so much in that power that he knew that it would have been a, a greater risk not to follow the will of God and the leading of the Spirit in that moment and not enter into the battle. That was a greater risk, so aware he was of the power of God and knowing that God will get done what God will get done. The least risky place for David to be was in the middle of the will of God, no matter how scary that looked or that looks in your life, how embarrassing that could be, how frightening that could be. And we, the golf gallery, called the church, all applaud politely and go, Yay, David, way to go. Rah, that's a great Bible story. But then when I go home, or I think about it this week, I think, when in the world have I ever really risked my life for God, for the eternal significance of what it means to know Him? Do I even believe in God's power in my life? Or is it just a Bible thing and doesn't really play out nowadays? Would I ever take a risk like that? Can I be young enough and naive enough and foolish enough in such a beautiful way as to throw all caution to the wind and follow where His Spirit is blowing and whispering? Truly I say to you, truly, truly I say to you, the Son can do nothing, apart, uh, nothing of His own accord but only what He sees His Father doing. For whatever the Father does, Jesus said, the Son does likewise. Jesus is the model of what it means to be a Christian and to have, be a human being and have life. Whatever the Father does, you're to do. We're to do. Does that really have any resonance with your life, with my life? <laughs> 